timer on there. Go away. Good morning, everybody. So uh, we talked a little bit about kind of, you know, the business vision, and we talked a bit of the culture that you would need to, to start thinking in these more disruptive ways. I want to talk a little bit about the, 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 the mechanisms is a bit, is a bit too, 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 too narrow, but, but, but ultimately we've got to deliver software. And I think we can kind of look at the history of the software development industry, and we can kind of look at surveys like these. And uh, these are not scientific surveys. These, these are not... Uh, accurate. The data that we collect from these sorts of things are, are kind of uh, subjective, but they tend to tell, when you look at these things over, you know, in, in the large, they tend to tell a reasonably consistent picture. And that consistent, pic cons consistent picture is one of doom and gloom. This one is, if you're a fan of Schadenfreude, this last one's kind of amusing in a sad kind of way. Uh, in a study of nearly 6,000 large projects, 17% of them go so badly that they threaten the existence of the company that perform, performing them. The history of the software development industry is not a great one in terms of execution. And I, th I think there are some good reasons for that. I, th I think that fundamentally, we've kind of got the model wrong. If software development was a normal thing, there would be a normal distribution of success, as many uh, projects would finish ahead of schedule, under budget, delighting their users, as finish behind schedule, over budget, and pissing off their users. And I don't think that's what we find as normal. <clears throat> I don't think that's what we think of as normal for our industry. I think what we think of is much more like this. Uh, it's much more weighted towards the failure end of the spectrum. And that, tell, that ought to tell us something fairly profound. I'm going to say the words that I used again. If software projects were a normal thing, there would be a normal distribution. The fact that there is a not a normal distribution tells us that there is something abnormal in the way in which we undertake software projects. I think we have the model wrong. Um, I, what I'm talking about, really, is, 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 tip, is, is, is exemplified by this picture for me. I love this picture. This is two different views of the solar system, the orbits of the planets in the solar system. On the right-hand side, we have the, helio, the geocentric view of the solar system, assuming that the Earth is at the centre of the solar system. On the, right, the left-hand side, we have the, the uh, uh, heliocentric view of the solar system, assuming that the Sun's at the centre. This is the model that we had for tens of thousands of years. Uh, if you live in this model, if you live in this solar system, Newton can't come up with an inverse square law. Einstein can't come along later on with bendy sheets of space-time and general relativity. Those theories do not flow from this. I believe that this is a fairly good analogy for the software industry at large. Large proportions of it inhabit the wrong solar system. They have the wrong model of what software development is. Fundamentally, software development and the kinds of cultural changes and business-focused disruption that we've talked about so far this morning are exercises in creativity and learning. It's about learning and adapting, and in order to be able to do that, we need engineering practices and development practices that support that level of change. So I would argue that, that over, over the history has been kind of somewhat mixed and, and, and that software development has been less than optimal uh, over the years. But I think that there's kind of been signs of hope in, in, in recent changes. I think we've learned what works. I, I, I picked this, 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 this image with some care. Uh, this is not um, shiny. This is not, this is not a beautiful uh, vehicle. But it is a bicycle with a jet engine attached to it. Um, it's kind of, this was built in somebody's shed. We, it, this, these things are a little bit handcrafted. They're a little bit rough around the edges at the moment. But, but this, I think this is a, a reasonably good picture of the sort of thing that we're talking about. So what have we tried over the years in looking at software development as, a, as, a, as an endeavour? We, we've tried looking at other industries and we've tried to learn lessons from those. And we've come up with models like the waterfall model, and V models, and we've tried coming up with dividing problems into smaller pieces so that we can execute them uh, more efficiently, and we ended up building siloed organisations where we slowed ourselves down too much. We tried being more iterative and doing more things in parallel and, and, and so on, and, and in that particular example, we ended up drowning in paperwork. We've tried using um, more agile thinking in terms of our, the processes that we apply. Uh, this is a picture of the Scrum process. Any ideas how many times the Scrum process mentions the words code or software? None. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a decent project management uh, 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 approach, but it says nothing about the engineering discipline that's, that, that 
underp underpins software development. We've tried uh, adding some of that engineering in the form of extreme programming and those sorts of ideas. We've tried hiring really smart people and putting them in the corner somewhere. We've tried hiring young, smart people because they're cheaper. And we've tried hiring young, smart people in foreign countries because they're cheaper still. And none of that has really solved the problem for us. There's an interesting kind of sidebar here. We can kind of look at the historical record. This is the document that introduced the concept of waterfall to our industry for the first time. This was published um, uh, as part of an IEEE conference on, on engineering in 1970. It was published by a, a chap called Dr. Winston Royce. Um, and this is the famous diagram somewhere. Here's the famous diagram that we've all seen, the, the, the classic waterfall picture. You can kind of imagine reading the proceedings of the conference and saying, oh, yeah, I get it. And, and, and you know, the, the, this, doc, this diagram's on the second page. Yeah? Oh, yeah, I get it. I won't bother reading the rest. It's 15 pages long. But I understand that. So go back to your team, write it down on the 1970s version of a whiteboard and say, we'll do this. It was, which is kind of a shame, because if you've gone as far as the next paragraph... Uh, it says this. The implementation described above is in risky and invites failure. Uh, the testing phase, which occurs at the end of the development cycle, is the first event for which timing, storage, input, output, transfers, etc., are experienced as distinguished from analysed. These phenomena are not precisely analysable. So the document that introduced the concept of waterfall to our industry was saying, whatever you do, don't do waterfall. That would be stupid. <coughs> so uh, it's kind of a shame. Uh, this is the diagram that's on about the 15th page of the document. It kind of builds up this diagram as a series of steps is the way that the document is organised. And you can see it's not quite so interesting, I I immediately appealing, uh, it, to be honest. Uh, it's not, easily, it's not e quite so easily memorable. But there's some fascinating things in this diagram, this 1970s diagram. Uh, up here it says, do the job twice if possible. It says, testing must be planned, controlled, and monitored. It says, involve the customer in the development process. Gain feedback. It says, explicitly, call, establish concrete feedback from testing into software development and from software development into software requirements. I think with the benefit of 21st century hindsight, we'd probably refer to this as an agile method. But that's not the lesson that we picked from it. Uh, this is a picture of a nasty accident that happened on the, the west coast of Ireland. So there's, a, there's, there's this key side here and that there's a car has fallen into the water. What do you do under these circumstances? Well, you, you go and rent a crane, right? Oops. <laughs> well, what do you do now? Anybody play? Bigger crane, thank you. <laughs> You can see where this is going, right? <laughs> Einstein described insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So after, if our software development processes don't completely fulfill our needs, we should change them. We should change them in any way that we, that we like, but we should change them to try and understand what does work. I think this is a good place to start in terms of that change. We should first think about what fundamentally software development is about. And I would argue that it's about this. It's about having a business idea. It's about getting that idea out into the hands of users as quickly and as efficiently as we can, and then understanding the impact of that idea on our user community. That feedback cycle is absolutely crucial to the success. And so we ought to be optimizing for this. This is what software development should be. It should be trying to get those ideas out quickly, efficiently, uh, and reliably into the hands of users so that we can learn. A quick question. I'm going to show you some pictures that are meant to, meant to mislead you. What's the most uh, successful invention in human history? Any suggestions? The wheel. The wheel? I, I have some wheels. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I, I, I think alphabets, maybe, is a good share. Uh, all wrong. I, I, I think it's this. I think it's science. I think if you look at the history of, of, of our species, we've existed as a distinct species for around 200,000 years. People 200,000 years about were, were, were pretty much the same as us. They had the same number of neurons in their heads. They were just as smart as us. And yet, pretty much for 200,000 years, the history of humanity is a basic agrarian society. The Stone Age first, and then we learned agriculture later on. But basically, that's as, that's as advanced as we got. And then, about 300, 250 years ago, something changed, 
and the, 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 the pace of change, the pace of learning for our species rocketed. It, on any non-logarithmic scale, progress measured on almost any measure is a flat line and then a vertical line, which kind of goes, starts really taking off through the 20th century and then just goes off the chart uh, now. Everything that we do, everything that we do. So what happened then? It was the Enlightenment. It was the introduction, introduction of scientific reasoning. It was the introduction of evidence-based decision-making. The science, and what I'm talking about is not large hadron colliders and space shuttles. I'm talking about this, the, the scientific method. The scientific method is the most profound idea, really, that, that, that we've had so far in terms of the impact on our society. Our modern high-tech society is based on this idea. Software development, I would argue, is one of the more difficult things that we as a species undertake. Software is ephemeral. It's difficult to reason about. It's kind of ideas crystallized in a way that they can execute on a computer. It's hard to get it right. Wouldn't it be a good idea to apply humanity's best problem-solving technique to one of the more challenging things that we undertake? And yet, I think we don't. I think if I think back to my career, I've been in software development for about 35 years, and for most of that time, mo most of the software development that I did was based on guesswork. We'd guess about what our users wanted. We'd guess about whether our software was going to work. We'd guess about whether there were any bugs in it. We wouldn't measure these things. We'd guess whether we'd be able to deploy it when it came true. We'd guess whether my bit was going to work with your bit. All of that stuff, we wouldn't evaluate those things. We wouldn't measure those things. We wouldn't capture data on those things. We wouldn't learn, really, and adapt. So I, I think this is kind of ground zero. This is the starting point for anything that's going to be effective. What I'm talking about here is the, the use and establishment of effective feedback loops to allow us to learn and adapt in a variety of ways. At the outside here, we've got this idea, have an idea, get it out into the hands of our users, understand what they make of it. At the inside, the technical practices that kind of un, that underpin that, of being able to write a test and see it fail and write some code to make it pass and understand what's happening from there and allow us to move very forward very quickly. Uh, this is one of you can tell from the no, nature of my conversation that I'm kind of a popular science nerd. And this is one of my fav favorite scientists. This is Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, essentially invented quantum field theory, one of the pr most profound ideas in, in, in human experience. Uh, and he was a genuine genius. And yet he says, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, if you guess, and that guess can't be backed by experimental evidence, it's still only a guess. So we should be thinking about moving away from guesswork and into the realm of evidence and experiment. I'm going to show you two things. So one way is in which we can kind of measure the effect of this is, is, is an idea called cycle time. The idea of cycle time is imagine a single one-line change to your production system. And imagine that change going through all of the normal steps that it ought to go through in order for you to, 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 to properly fulfill the demands of your software development process. It's like a die trace analysis of your software development process. I'm going to show you two cycle times from two projects that I worked on. The first one was for a bank. We did an, it was, this was an order management system. This bank could not really release a single line change to its production system and fulfill all of its own policies in terms of software development in under 103 days. If you've got a cycle time of 103 days, you don't really have a feedback loop. The next cycle time is for, I was privileged to be involved in a startup. We built one of the world's highest performance financial exchange, uh, exchanges, trading in FX. And in that situation, the project was probably somewhere between 15 and 20 times the size of the projects on the top. And in this project, we could make any change to our production system, evaluate it to the point where there was no more work to do, no more human decision-making before being completely comfortable with pressing a button and having that change go out into production, any change to our whole system, and get an answer back in 57 minutes. Performance tests, uh, behavioral tests, uh, technical, uh, technical tests of the system, uh, but also the configuration of the system, the deployment of the system, all of it, everything, 
was testable and we get an answer back in 57 minutes. We once decided we didn't like the commercial terms that we had with our relational database vendor and so we decided to swap it out. It took us a morning because we, we made the change to use the new version of the, the, the relational database. We automated the deployment of that. We tried it out. It failed a couple of tests. We put it through again. We fixed the test, put it through again. They all passed. The next time it went into production, it went with a new database. I've worked in organizations where just that would probably be a year-long project for a team of four or five people. This is a dramatic improvement in performance. So what are we talking about? We're talking about, uh, so first, the term continuous delivery. It's the first principle of the Agile Manifesto. It's the logical extension of continuous integration. It's this holistic approach to software development. It encompasses all of software development. It touches on everything. This is a cultural change. It's a shift in the way in which you think and approach uh, software development. A good mental model for this is that every time that we commit a change, we're giving birth to a release candidate, and the job of our process and our technology from now on is to prove that that release candidate is not fit to make it into production. This is another lesson that we learn from science. We can never have enough tests to prove that our software is good, but we only need one test to fail to know that our software is not good enough, and therefore we can reject it. So we can use the, the, the techniques of falsifiability to validate our changes. And done, uh, scrum people some sometimes talk about definitions of done. The only real definition of done is in the hands of users doing something useful that they care about. We're trying to create a repeatable, re reliable process for releasing software, which means that we need to automate everything. If we're going to automate everything, we've got to version control everything. We're going to take this to, to, to an extreme to be able to move this forward. We're going to treat quality as a first-class principle um, uh, of, of, of our development process. In the example of the exchange in which we worked, we were in production for 13 months and five days before the first bug was identified by a user. That's different to normal experience of software, certainly different to most experience that I had prior to that. Prior to that. Um, we're going to work on, on, on completion of features every day, all of the time, continually, and we're going to be working to improve continuously, not just our technology, but our business understanding, our cultural understanding, the organizational structures. We're going to refine and modify those continually to improve. Uh, this is me showing off. If Agile Software Development was the opening act to a great performance, continuous delivery is the headliner. I think it's a fair, fair statement to claim that continuous delivery is currently viewed as state of the art for, for, for what we understand how best to, uh, to under, undertake uh, software development. Uh, it works better than anything else that we know so far. Uh, this is one of the ideas that's kind of core to, to the practice of continuous delivery. It's the idea of a deployment pipeline. And fundamentally what this is about is that every change destined for, for, for production flows through this one channel, this mechanism called a deployment pipeline. We're going to evaluate it from the point of view of developers. We're going to, we're going to, first, we're going to version control everything, not just our source code, but its configuration, its de the deployment tools, all of the things that it depends on, the environments, the operating systems, the relational database, everything. We're going to version control all of that. And we're going to automate pretty much all of it. We're going to evaluate it from the point of view of developers. We're going to evaluate it from the point of view of uh, um, the users who are, going to, who are going to interact with the software. We might do some manual testing. We might do some uh, performance testing. All of these things, uh, if all of this automation says that the change is good, at the end, there's not much to choose. We can be fairly comfortable with pressing a button and allowing it to go into production. Continuous delivery, one, one little kind of nuance. Continuous delivery is not identically the same to continuous deployment. Continuous deployment is working so that if all your automation is good, you just push the change into production. It's great if that's the right business. Continuous delivery is working in a way so that your software is always in a releasable state. Um, it's not always valid to automatically push it into production. It's not always a great idea um, to, to do that. It, uh, the, one of the organizations that practices continuous delivery with, with some rigor is Volvo Trucks. A modern Volvo truck is a sophisticated computing platform running typically 80 million lines of code. If I was a Swedish lorry driver driving a Volvo truck around an, around an icy road late at night in the sleet and the rain next to a drop-off a, on a mountainside, I don't want a software update then, if I'm honest. I would rather it waited until it was in the garage and parked up for the night. So the continu continuous delivery and continuous deployment are not necessarily identical things. Around about this time, I sometimes get a pushback. So, okay, so this may work for small teams, small projects, but it can't possibly scale. 
Google pretty much do this on, uh, in a single repository. Pretty much all of Google's software exists in a single repository, and every commit evaluates against everything. Um, they, this is out of date now, but a few years ago, they were, they were claiming to have um, uh, 100 million lines of code. They're now talking in the billions. I th the last thing that I read, they got 9 billion lines of code under version control. Um, they'd run 60 million lines of code. Um, there are more than 100 million test cases uh, executed every day. It's, it's going to be, the numbers are going to be way more than this. So this scales quite well. So if you've got a problem that's bigger than that, I'd be really interested to see how you're doing. But otherwise, it scales quite well. The other pushback that I sometimes get is, are you insane? You want me to release how often? Our releases are a nightmare. We release once every six months. It's a nightmare. I'm worrying for weeks before that. How could you possibly do that? It's too risky. My answer to that is the Amazon build process. The, the means, how many people have used Amazon re in the last couple of weeks? Which version did you use? <laughs> it's a stupid question that not even Amazon could answer because on average they're pushing a change into production once every 11.6 seconds. On average that changing is, change is being deployed to 10,000 servers. It's completely automated. You can't do anything else on that kind of scale. It would be insane to be doing anything else. And since they've been doing that, they've seen a dramatic reduction in outages and an increase in quality. Working more quickly in smaller batches, finer-grained changes going more quickly into production is a safer way of working. One of the other things that I should have mentioned to, to this audience when I was talking about the exchange, we also built all of the compliance features into our deployment pipeline. If a change went through our deployment pipeline, uh, it was automatically fully compliant. It met all of the regulatory needs, and that allowed us to go really fast. Okay, okay, so this technology might be fine for nice, simple websites like Amazon and Google, but my technology is quite hard. Well, my answer for that one is the HP LaserJet firmware team. The HP LaserJet firmware team had an interesting challenge. They were in a horrible mess, uh, but they did an analysis of, of, the, uh, of where they were in the development process. The bottom line was, in 2008, only 5% of their global development effort, about 450 people, um, was spent on delivering new features. After they changed to adopting the sorts of practices that I'm describing here, eight times as much effort was now expended on features that were valuable to the organization. This is a dramatic change, and the data bears this out. If you start looking at this, there's, there's some really great numbers. Uh, for, the, for the HP LaserJet team, the, over, the, the development costs per program were reduced by 70% through the adoption of these sorts of techniques. And that is borne up through experience across industry sectors and across the world. There's been some excellent work uh, done by uh, my, my co-author on, uh, 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 on continuous delivery with, with a bunch of other people. Um, uh, uh, notably, um, uh, Nicole Fosgren in the latest book, Accelerate, and uh, Barry uh, in uh, Lean Enterprise, talking about some of these ideas. But the analysis of the data from these, using kind of scientifically valid statistical techniques, points to some astounding outcomes. Or teams that practice these kinds of disciplines they produce higher quality software more quickly. They have dramatically redu re redu dramatic reduction in, in defects. They, um, uh, the bottom line, though, is fascinating. The organizations that practice this kind of approach to software development make more money than organizations that don't. I have a friend who does day trading on the, the, uh, the New York markets, um, and he changed his strategy a couple of years ago just for fun. He decided he was only going to invest his money in organizations that publicly spoke about DevOps and continuous delivery. Since he's been doing that, he's currently 120% um, up on the NASDAQ average over that two-year period. So who practices continuous delivery? Um, kind of the, the, the usual suspects, men, many of them. But there's also a few names that, that, that may surprise you. So Google, Amazon, Nokia, whoever they were. Um, Flickr, um, HP, Netflix, all of those sorts of planes. But also the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, LMAX, which is my exchange where we, where we built our exchange, was, was kind of a, a, an example, a, a clean room example of what you can do when you really take this to heart. ING, the Dutch bank, have done some, made some remarkable differences. They, 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 attack, they, they now attract a higher quality of staff because it's seen as a cool, interesting, fun place to work. 
because one of the other attributes of continuous delivery is that the people working in these environments enjoy it more. It's less stressful. Uh, the, other, the last one is probably SAP, which, surpri which surprised me when I first saw them, because you know, that, that's part of my mental model of a legacy system. And I've done a bunch of work with Siemens Health and Aeneas doing work in the um, health sector for software that runs machines that could kill people. So this is not for trivial systems. This is, this is genuinely world-class engineering applied in often difficult, challenging circumstances. And all of the data says that it works better. That's my talk. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great day.